Breaking Damn. news! This just in! I'm still a douche! <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Thank you for the update in the field. Next up, Garrett Adelstein punches back with a lengthy write-up of his experience playing on the Hustler Casino Live. I know what you're thinking. Finally, it's nice to see this challenge cover what's happening at the Hustler. It's a shame we've avoided it for so long. Next up, potential future high stakes crusher slash upswing pro Landon Tice says, the only way to settle the salt for Wyvers upswing is a UFC style cage match. A UFC style cage fight between these training sites? I'm gonna have to think about that. In unrelated news, upswing poker hires new coach Olivier Bousquet for his strong grasp of post-flop concepts. Very strong grasp. Uh, just, just so we're clear, neither Landon or Olivier are upswing pros, but, you know, the future's open. Also tonight, a big hand is making the rounds from Poker Go, where two players get all in and don't exactly realize who won the pot. For hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a pretty good game. And finally tonight, disgruntled former Heads Up Pro issues $100,000 Heads Up Challenge to the world. But will anyone have the kahunas to take this challenge? I can certainly think of some people that won't. All this and more tonight on Poker News. Polker News. Polk or news, not a silent L. All right, before we get rolling today, I want to let you guys know that The Lodge has a $2 million guaranteed main event with a $3,000 buy-in happening in mid-May. This tournament is going to be huge. I will be there playing, and we will also have a series of high roller events going on around the main event. So if you want to play some higher stakes tournaments and have a chance to win a lot of money, head on down late April to mid-May to The Lodge Card Club. Let's jump into the news, and I know it was our last story in the opener, but I want to open with this, guys. I am issuing a $100,000 buy-in heads-up challenge to the world. Anyone can take it. Come on down to the lodge, 100k buy-in, 200, 400 blinds, bring a couple of bullets. We're going to duke it out in the felt for a full weekend. If anyone, and I mean anyone, please, wants to play heads-up, I will accept your challenge. Looking forward to playing a variety of opponents and some tough opponents over at the Lodge. I'm sure some great players will accept this challenge, but who would you like to see step up to the plate? I got a few people that I can think of right at the top of my head. Let's move on and talk about this hand from Poker Go on the show, No Gamble, No Future. Now, if you're not familiar with the show, No Gamble, No Future, it is a series that Poker Go has put together more recently where we will play really high stakes, a lot of business guys in the mix, and it has been the source for a lot of great clips and entertainment for the poker world. I've got some pretty exciting news on that front. Over the years, Poker Go has typically been pretty protective with their content, but I have gotten the go-ahead to be able to review some of the hands happening over on their show, so we're definitely going to be jumping into that. I wasn't going to break down a hand today, but you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, let's roll the tape. Sugar Land, which is like right outside of Houston. I got to work a couple of the events, man. I'd be fine with soccer if they, you know, scored. You, you go to any games here? Well, in your son's no, games, there really probably are more guys. goals. Oh. Yeah, they, it's <laughs> yeah. very well, intense. You believe me. You know, like 10, 12, 10, yeah. exactly. <laughs> at the professional it. level, though, I mean. Yeah. I'll be trying to pounce here with the three vent out of the big blind. Person not the type to fold the queen eight suit. No, he's, he's stuck. He wants to mix it up. He feels like he's the strongest player at the table. <sighs> yeah, right? Our hand begins at 100, 200, 400, with the 400 being a straddle, I believe. And Eric Person opens it up with the queen eight of hearts. Uh, this is a little bit loose here from this spot, but uh, only slightly loose. The players are very deep, so it might be reasonable every now and then. Button does call with queen jack offset, which seems all right. It's a bit loose, but again, probably fine, although this is a bit of a bigger open preflop. And Pennzoil Don calls with the king nine of spades in the smallest blind. Typically in the smallest blind, you want to be re-raising or folding preflop. So I don't really love this call, uh, but he does decide to go ahead and make the flat. Uh, the, the big blind now, Oppenheim has ace jack offsuit, and he decides it's time to squeeze, making it $10,000 to go. This is a very large re-raise, but I do think you need to make it a big size when you squeeze here because you're frankly going to get called by a lot of loose hands, and you need to knock the riffraff out of the pot and have some chance of winning this preflop. You're also out of position. I will note, despite what people usually think, that as you get deeper, you should think about bigger. You actually, actually, you should actually think about smaller as the stacks get deeper, which is counterintuitive, but it is the reality. 
Anyway, uh, this hand not over yet. Person does decide to make the call here with the queen eight of hearts. I will know, I think there's some chance that person actually called an open and the opener had only folded when this clip started. So that might change the analysis slightly, but really won't change it all too much. Pearson does decide to call with the queen. It's suited again, a bit loose here. This is a hand you're going, you're going to want to fold, especially versus this large of a three bet. But they are deep, which makes it a little bit better. Still not a hand you probably want to flat. Over to Pennzoil Dawn with King9 and Spades. The problem here for, for Pennzoil Dawn is he's going to be out of position. I do like the way the suited king is playing three-bet pots because typically speaking, three-betters like to go a little aggressive on those king high boards. I like that aspect of your hand, but you're going to be out of position. So again, I really think this hand should have just been folds pre-flop with Oppenheim taking it down. Anyway, Pennzoil Dawn does call. Let's take a flop. Whoa. Comes Jack-10-8, rainbow with one spade uh, this is action for everybody's got everybody, a little something going right. on with already 30,000 in the middle open i'm with the best hand at the moment fire 17k and for don i mean pencil we're not going anywhere we're so open any backdoor spades yeah. he's in there this pot has escalated quickly more than 84k in the middle the flop comes Jack-10-8, Rainbow. Everyone hits. We've got top pair, top kicker for Oppenheim. Bottom pair, a gutter, and a backdoor flush draw for Person. And we have an open-ended straight draw and backdoor flush draw for Pennzoil Don. So everyone's got a piece. Don checks it as he always should. And now Oppenheim decides to bet a little over half pot. I'm not a huge fan of this bet size on this board. On boards that have a straight, typically speaking, you're going to like a little bit of a smaller size than this because your opponents are a little bit more polarized. Either they have a card in their hand that's a seven through a queen or they don't. If they don't, they're going to fold. And if they do, they're likely going to continue. Also, when you're multi-way, the bigger flop sizes get, typically the worse it is for you. I, I know the logic here with Ace Jack is let's bet and, and really thin the field out and get some value. There are a lot of bad turns for us, but I do think when you bet, you probably want to use more like a 40% pot size. I know that's probably getting in the weeds a little too much, but I do think it's a bit too big. Over to Pearson here versus this bet. He's just going to have to call. You're in position. You have a gutter. You have the back door fluster a lot of ways. You can take this pot away. So uh, I like this to call. I wouldn't mind every now and then throwing in a raise, basically bluff raising and looking to barrel some turns and rivers possibly. But certainly at least call is going to be the play. Over to Don now. This is an awkward situation. You can really see the value position kind of playing out here. He has a reasonably good draw. A queen's going to give him a two card straight. Uh, and a seven's going to give him a hand that would only lose to queen nine. He also can hit a nice pair with the king, which would actually be good in this scenario. Or he can hit back to spades. So he's going to have to call a raise. You're probably supposed to do a little bit of both. The problem with raising here is he's more or less just going to have to jam. I mean, he could make it like 40K and fold to a jam, 45K, but the bet's seven. It's, it's, it's hard to find room here to bluff that isn't all in. I do think every now and then he should go for an all in or maybe a small raise and mainly just call. He decides to play it slowly here and he does call and let's take a turn. We're still three ways in this big pot. And the turn is the 10 of spades. It's a straight flush draw now for Pennzoil Don. Oh, but I'm still with the best hand. Opie concerned about a 10, maybe even against the flop straight. You, you just have to be. And does Eric Person in position use this 10? As a bluffing candidate, and it looks like that's exactly what he's considering. He's saying, I've got all the tens. I don't think Don has one. I don't think Opie has one. I'm going to represent. 68000 $68,000. Don just has a, a huge draw. Staring person down. Person not giving him too much. Sometimes see Eric talk during the hands, not here. Don with a little bit more than 110K behind. Can you call 68? Big pairs are tough, right? Here comes person. Yeah, no speech a play. little bit of talk. It 
would be so sick if he just said, all right, you know what, let's play for all of it. Person might have to fold, <laughs> right. thinking he's just dead. For just 45k more right. in a pot, that would be more than 200k. And if Don does it, he's simply thinking, Why let's just gamble. Probably. There it is. And he's he all does edge. jam. This could work. What, what about me? Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I didn't know what you. What am I? What, One more. Empty chair here? I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know you. I mean, maybe I have something really good. Not lying. I, I might have to uh, fold. Fold. Is going to lay it down. And person has asked for a count. The turn comes to 10, pairing the board, but also putting spades up there for Don. Don checks, as he should with all of his hands, and now Oppenheim's got a bit of a decision to make. His hand still could pretty likely be good. However, there are a lot of hands that haven't beat now, hands like a 10, uh, hands that trap the flop. Those hands are all have all moved into the lead, and it's a three-way spot. The pot's already big enough for your hand. It's time to slow this down and see if you can win at showdown, and I like the idea to check, which he decides to do. Person now has a bit of an awkward situation because... On one hand, he's going to want to, you know, put a reasonable size bet here uh, versus Oppenheim as they're deeper. But Don is a little bit more shallow, and so it makes the spot kind of awkward. Personally, I think he should. Personally, uh, I think he should probably check because he has other hands to bluff with, like Ace Queen, King Queen, uh, King Nine Suited, Ace Nine Suited, plenty of other hands. I think he should just see if he has some showdown value. Check this back and play the river. But I don't mind every now and then going for a bet. If you do bet, I think you should use a small size with the logic being that Don essentially will have to play uh, fairly straightforward versus this. And if you use a big size and you're bluffing, well, you're simply just going to give Don more money when he has a hand. And Oppenheim is going to play relatively similar versus smaller or bigger bets. So I just don't see something, a reason to bet more than something around, let's just say 35, 40,000 in this particular instance. Anyway, person has other ideas and decides to bet 68,000. Action now over to Don. Tough spot. And this is, again, you see the value position here. He has the open ender. He has the flush draw. He almost just has to play getting direct odds. But there's also a chance behind that he's smoked by Oppenheim. So I don't know what you're supposed to do here, guys. All three options are on the table. That's why you guys tune in for that kind of expert analysis. Do some stuff. You're welcome. Anyway, Don decides it's time to raise. He makes it all in to go. Oppenheim now with top bear, top kicker has no choice. He's going to have to let this go. And Don's move here actually does isolate the pot pretty well. The problem for Don's going to be even when Eric is bluffing, he's going to have to call something like 45000 to win a pot that's going to be, you know, let's just say $310,000. So... You have very little fold equity here, even if Eric is bluffing. Now, if Eric has king-queen or something, he's probably going to fold. But it's just a very small number of hands that you can realistically get to fold in this situation. Queen-8, though, might be one of them. Anyway, Oppenheim does make a reasonable lay down here with his ace-jack. There's two guys betting. Anyone can have a 10. Totally fine. He's going to let this one go. And now the action's back on Eric Person. What does Eric do here? You're getting an amazing price, but is this ever a bluff? Well, what happens next is pretty amazing. You went once. Oh, Always God. once. Oh, God. Man. I didn't like that. <laughs> is, oh, that a, is that a call? Huh? You have kings, right? I had a draw. I had no pair. Oh, my God. Man. Has he called Wait, you? Did, did he call? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you? You give me action. I, he asked I, for a count. I, I don't think, I don't he think called. he's called. And Don just said his hand. Don he is, said he didn't call yet. Why yeah, should I didn't call, call yet? Man. I'm, I'm calling him. Yeah. 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 Oh, my gosh. No, I thought we he all had been, not so called. Yeah, he's he's called him. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm calling. One time. Let's go. Did you say call? Yeah. And here oh, is wait, the wait, call. What? Don thinks that person had already called, but he hadn't. He had just asked for a count. So he honestly tells him he has no pair, and then he has a little bit of a reaction where he realizes that he gave up his hand in this huge pot before his opponent had made a decision. I just want to say this kind of stuff can happen from time to time, and people shouldn't feel too bad about it. It's horrible for your EV, of course, to jam 110,000 and say what you have. Don't do that. But shit happens in poker, man. I see stuff all the time where people accidentally tip their hand off. 
and especially for people that don't play play as often and i assume penzoil dawn is probably i don't know doing some some penzoil penzoil related matters in general you shouldn't feel too bad just learn that when you go all in don't say anything until the dealer says call and show your cards Back to the hand though, if person hadn't called before, now you think he will call for sure. The only exception might be, does he think that Don is bluffing here and saying that he has nothing? But I think with how authentic this reaction is, I think Eric knows what he's gotta do. So person is oh so slightly ahead. Wow, Penzoil Don has 19 outs to win a $310,000 pot. It's always one time. Golly. They will run it once. Y'all are crazy. I would have probably called. You would have winning. You were winning. What is it? I mean, they don't have anything. Right? <laughs> River card. <laughs> yes. It's the I eight of that. spades, so it's a full house for I person. Action, huh? Don they celebrated. Action, Did, was it Don the, the one who said yes? No, or think, was it person? Okay. You're on the draw. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thinks that he won. In, so I can tell him what I have. He I thinks he won. I think so too. It will work out for you. Yeah. Don is not the winner. How much more was it? But he has a full house. Like another 24. Oh, just 20. So that's a full can you tell house. Eric, he won the hand. <laughs> Eric, can you tell him he Person won. stormed off. I think Eric, Person thought he lost Eric. also. Oh, he actually wins. Eric! Yeah. What? I forgot. I thought I win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he thought so too. Wait. Oh, because he Eric won the, won the hand. I have he never seen house. anything oh, like this. Don celebrated. I I Eric I stormed off. On him. He actually made oh, me think he won. Man, that's a wow. Fuck. I thought I won. My bad. He makes the call, and the river is the eight of spades. Don gets there. But Eric's got a full house. Don, you lose. You lose. Somebody tell the guy. Somebody let him know. You lose. Oh my god. Don. Don, what are you doing, man? This is just tough to watch. And what what happened with Eric here? Just stormed off? He, does he think he lost this? Does anyone know what they have? Does anyone know how poker works? This is a pretty good... Is that Batman? Is that Mr. Dr. Batman? What the hell, man? Mr. Dr. Batman in the mix? Is that a Lodge hat? Is he rip ripping the Lodge? You just love to see it. If you guys would like to see more content from Poker Go, you can check the links out in the description below and watch daily Poker Go content highlights over on their YouTube channel. You can check it out below. I know you guys didn't expect a hand analysis and you want me to get down to the story that you're all here for. So fine, let's get into it. Somebody took a shit in front of the Bellagio. Oof. That's one of the worst bad beats I've seen at the Bellagio poker room. All right, I know that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Garrett Adelstein's response to what's been happening online. So uh, over the last few days, we've been talking a lot about the Hustler, Hustler Casino Live. Nick Airball came in the channel to talk about his experiences with Garrett. He obviously had a lot of negative things to say. Well, Garrett said he's done biting his tongue and issued this tweet saying, I've done a lot of tongue biting over the past six months, just didn't have it in me this morning to do it yet again. Now, I'm not gonna read you all four of these tweets because, or all four of these screenshots because there's a lot of words. But the cliff notes of this essentially are that he used to battle a lot online. Now he plays poker a lot less. When he does play, he is a business. He is trying to make money. That is the point of when he plays. It is not a team sport. And he did try to make sure he played in the best games, which essentially is his right as a business, which is respectable and understandable. He also says, I did not control lineups and that they would look different if he did. Uh, which, you know, is a little bit of a, a contrast from what we heard from Nick Airball. Maybe he had influence, but he didn't have exact control. It depends on the way you want to argue those things. He didn't talk about his rating system for players. He didn't talk about some of the other people in LA. He didn't talk about if they wanted to play with him. He didn't talk about a few of those things, but he mainly just addressed, look, I'm a business. I'm trying to make money playing poker. I am a pro. I am the most well-known player or one of the most well-known players in the show. So yes, I will do what's in my power to get into a good game, which is a very different take than what we saw from Nick Airball just the other day, where essentially Nick said, we need this to be a good show. We need these games to be good. I'm sure you guys remember some of these clips. If you want to watch that whole interview, I'll put a link for you below and you can check it out. But going back to this, uh, he also concluded with saying that high stakes live poker is a blood sport played for mind boggling amounts of money. 
I often reflect on if I'm cut out for that world anymore, especially the politics. But I still love the game, and I suspect I'll be back in some form soon enough. Never missing out on an opportunity to try and promote himself, Doug Polk Poker weighed in. I'd love to have you join me for a discussion on this topic. We got to hear Nick's opinion the other day, but hearing your side of the story would help balance the conversation. I also understand not wanting to answer the pop, but if you're going to respond, I think a video format is best. G-Man responded and said, I hear you and don't disagree. I promise at some point I'll hop on a pot with you again. And I still plan on making a trip out to Texas to support your stream as well. That's it, guys. You heard it here first or second. At some point, he's going to hop on a pod again. And we're definitely look forward to, looking forward to that. If you want to see that, thumbs up this video and tweet at G-Man Poker. We want to hear your side of the story on the Doug Polk videos, poker, podcast, channel, whatever. Okay. The shameless self-promotion is done for the time being. Anyway, it would also be great to get, to get Garrett onto the Lodge Poker stream if he can make a trip. Of course, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to match some of these lineups in LA, but, you know, we do our best. That's going to do it today for Poker News Hands and whatever. Uh, I am glad you tuned in. And by the way, if you want to watch me play poker tomorrow, I will be playing on the Lodge. I'll be buying it for $100,000. You can check out the Lodge, Poker at the Lodge channel here on YouTube. Starts at 3 p.m. Central Time, and I'll see you there. Thanks, guys.